Okay, welcome back. In our last presentation this hour, we have Mary Elizabeth Brown, who's the director of the Aviva Young Artists Program. She's going to show us how art and science collide uh, to 3D print violins. So thanks, Mary Elizabeth. Thanks so much. So in 2018, I was a part of an interdisciplinary team based in Ottawa um, that embarked on a journey together and asked the question, what if we printed a violin? And the result at that point was a commission of a concerto for 3D printed instruments and orchestra and some playable violins. And so here we have an example. This was the moment. Oh my goodness. This is not quite what I was expecting. Okay, can I try? So as you can hear, the violin sounds like a violin. And that was the first iteration made completely of PLA, which is a plastic polymer used in 3D printing. In 2020, a team from Toledo, Ohio, and the Toledo Symphony Orchestra took over and started to create um, what you see in front of you, which is a rod-based model um, that you can clip together in several parts that's made from recycled plastic. They have continued along that journey and are well on their way to some good things. We've now taken over a Viva Young Artist program in an effort to make these instruments more accessible to young people. So we've changed things up a little bit. We, instead of using the pattern of a modern maker, took the measurements from a 1704 Stradivarius called the Betz Strad. And we put those into our CAD programs and use that as the basis for our model. Anyone who knows about instruments will tell you that the bridge and the sound post are the two things that matter the most and the two things that fall over the most frequently and need repair. So we embarked on a journey to see whether we could print them in. And the answer to that was also yes, eliminating the need for costly luthier services. Here we have a, a picture of an integrated bridge as well as the support structure that's needed to uh, print around the bridge in the printing process. We also moved to a clip-in structure where the hollow resonating body of the violin clips into a neck, um, just sort of like Lego, <laughs> uh, so that you can make it on a printer and clip it together without any harsh chemicals or epoxy. But the biggest difference came in our, our printing strategy. So we experimented with various materials and various wall thicknesses. If you are new to 3D printing, um, 3D printed materials are rarely completely solid. There are little tiny spaces that are printed into the material. So we made those little squares and the thickness of the walls is about uh, 0.8 millimeters. We felt, filled those little spaces, about 20%, and we made them squares instead of star shapes or hexagons. And we printed the violin at a 45 degree angle so that we wouldn't need so much support structure. But the best thing was that we scaled it so that children could use it. And so now children can print their own violins at home. So this is a one-tenth size and a very happy little kid who's getting to try it out. Um, for the first time. So here, if you'd like to hear what it sounds like. So this is on par with most 10 si tenth sized instruments that cost a lot more. And speaking of cost, the original project that we undertook in 2018 came in at more than 1,200 US dollars per instrument, which was not sustainable for the quality of the sound. And then in Toledo, they were able to get that cost down to um, under $150, which was a wonderful achievement. This last model that you've heard 
um, the, the printing cost by itself is seven US dollars. And to add the rest of the parts brings the total in to about 27 US dollars. So all of a sudden we've opened up the world to music education to people who might not have had access before. And so that's where we are. Any questions? Well, that's such a great, two great videos. Thank you, Mary Elizabeth. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a question. Um, just as a musician yourself, what, how does it feel to play one of these instruments versus a typical violin? Sure. So I am, um, unlike my colleagues here, I am neither a physicist nor a material scientist. Um, I am a, a concert violinist and teacher by trade, and my doctorate was interdisciplinary in music and organizational psychology. So this is not my discipline at all. Um, but I am fortunate to play on a 1766 Galliano, which is a very fine Italian instrument, so a good basis for comparison. What I find is that I'm able to find many of the same colors of sound, but maybe not as easily. So does it compare to a fine 18th century instrument? No. But is it serviceable? Absolutely. Great. So some audience questions. Um. Maybe you've talked to your colleagues about this, I'm not sure. Uh, but, but plastic is not wood, and, um, which makes me wonder why it sounds so similar and whether sort of going to a Stradivarius or, or you know, your own instrument you know, is worth the you know, 500 grand you shell out for it. I would have to be diplomatic in the way I, the way I answer <laughs> that one. <laughs> I think that there is a, if, if I'm completely honest, there's, there's a refinement in the color of sound that we find in um, 18th century and, and early 19th century Italian instruments that is hard to replicate. We've been trying to replicate that in wood for centuries. Um, but I think that we made a lot of progress in this last round of iterations by looking at Strad's model um, looking at exactly where the angles were, where the arches were, um, and and in fact, we pulled a couple of measurements from my own Galliano when we found that the, the sound was a little bit too direct. So I think that there's, there's still work to be done. Do I think that there's a half a million dollars worth of difference? In my opinion, yes, still, but maybe not forever. You talked about there's a lot of different parameters you got to play with, the infill, the type of material, all that. Uh, I was curious, what was the hardest to get right and what do you plan to tweak in the future? So I think the two main, uh, the two main factors there, first were the material itself. Um, so there were a, a number of iterations which were real flops. Um, I think the worst of them was ABS, which really kind of sounded like a tin can. Um, and there were some composites that we used, um, you know, so in, in 3D printing these days, um, there are, are filaments that have both plastic and wood. Um, and, and those, unfortunately, are not strong enough to support the weight of the bridge. So it really then becomes a little bit of a cost-benefit analysis of, you know, what's strong enough, what's resonant enough, how can we, how can we manage all of that? So that, that would be one thing. And then the other factor, surprisingly, that, that really played into this was the internal shape. So how we printed the inside. Um, so the original instruments, the original um, iterations had honeycombs or sort of hexagon shape. Um, this last round, uh, we went to a square shape and we found much more, uh, much more satisfaction there in terms of resonance. When's the double bass coming? <laughs> so one of the one of the missions I should say in the first part of this project we were um, we were successful in printing um, violins, violas, and what is effectively um, a shoulder cello, which is a rare but a, a, an actual thing that exists. It's tuned as a cello, but it's a, it's played on the shoulder like a violin. Um, and those larger instruments, uh, perhaps with less success than, than the smaller version of the violin. Um, the logistics of printing a double bass 
would require both a lot of time and an enormous printer. Um, so given that the, the underlying idea here was to make this accessible, you know, to be able to print a one-tenth size violin like the one that you see here that you can do on the printer at your local library now. We have a question from an online viewer. Uh, have you received any outreach from other educators? Is this model being used for teaching anywhere or are there plans to bring these to schools or camps? So um, this is very much hot off the press. This last iteration was printed two weeks ago. And so we are, this is the first time that this has been spoken about publicly. Um, and so there are for sure plans in the works to make this widely available. That's so exciting. Um, and just one question from the casual observer here. Um, speaking of making instruments accessible, do you see any potential in the future for maybe less accessible instruments being printed, the ones that maybe are not as common or harder to get, thus cost lots of money? I think, you know, when I look at where we were with 3D printing five years ago, so the, the instrument that you saw me play in the first video, um, that required an industrial printer, more than $1,000 and 66 hours of printing time in an industrial lab, that's not really realistic. And here we are just five years later, and you know, we're, we're in single digits in terms of printing cost, um, and it's something that is, is more and more accessible. So I think the short answer to that is yes, there's great hope that um, 3D printing uh, will allow us to make music education accessible to many, many more people. When I see how far we've come, I can only imagine how far there is to go. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mary Elizabeth. Um, and thanks to you all for joining us today at the 183rd meeting of the Acoustical Society of America. We'll be back for one final session at, of press conferences today at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Um, we'll be talking about supersonic flight without the sonic boom, the soundscapes, soundscapes of daycare centers, and noisy restaurants. So please reach out to media at AIP.org for any requests, and we'll see you then.